Thank you so much, choir. Great, great, great anthem for us this morning. If you have your Bible with you, I'm going to read two passages of Scripture for my primary text this morning. The first comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. And then we're going to jump over to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 20, we're just going to read one verse, verse 35 from there. These will be on the screen for you to follow along as well. Sorry. Proverbs, uh, actually I'm going to read verses uh, 24 and 25 of Proverbs chapter 11. It says this, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will also be refreshed. And then from the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 35. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. May God add his blessing to the hearing, reading, and understanding of this, his holy word. Amen. This morning I want to continue in a sermon series that I began last week called Enough, Discovering Joy Through Simplicity and Generosity. And I want to just tell you right up front basically why I'm doing this sermon series, uh, just so it doesn't feel like I'm doing one of those bait and switches on you guys. This is our stewardship campaign. It's an annual campaign that we do uh, in churches everywhere. If you've been involved in a church, you know typically in the fall, uh, the churches work together to uh, do a stewardship campaign to try to encourage the church to consider filling out a pledge card and giving uh, monetarily to the church for the upcoming year. Uh, next week in your bulletin, you'll receive a pledge card. And my prayer is that every family, every individual who considers Robert Steele United Methodist Church to be your home church will prayerfully consider what you'd like to give for the upcoming year and turn those pledge cards into us on the last week of September, that, that uh, 25th of September, two weeks from now. We will have a consecration of those pledge cards. Our finance committee will be meeting in October to put together our budget for 2017. And uh, my prayer since I've gotten here is that we would be uh, very generous this year, that we'd be able to raise our budget for 2017. Um, there are areas uh, in, the, in the budget currently that I'm, uh, I feel definitely need to be increased, particularly the areas of our children and our youth ministries. Uh, I feel like we need to truly invest in, in the, the generation that's coming behind us. Um, Paul just asked how many of y'all were remember 2001, uh, September 11, 2001, and all of us in here remember September 11, 2001. The only people who wouldn't remember it are those who are 15 or younger, and uh, we don't have a lot of those folks. Um, and uh, I think we can have a lot of those folks. In fact, we have a lot of those folks on Sunday nights and on Wednesday nights, uh, as Garrett continues to do an amazing job with our youth ministry here. We've uh, had upwards of 25 to 30 students that are coming on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights for those activities. We want to find a place for them to feel comfortable coming and being in worship with us as well and becoming more part of the life of the church. Uh, obviously, we have lots of children that are coming. We want to continue to see that. I believe that uh, God has some wonderful things in store for this church in the future. But uh, we can't do it without the generosity of the people of God who consider this their church home. So please be prayerfully considering how you're going to give to the church this year so that we can put together a budget that will reflect um, uh, God's heart and desire for this church for the, for the coming year. But today I want to speak on the topic then of extravagant generosity. Extravagant generosity. I think it's an appropriate topic for today when we think about 9-11 and the extravagant generosity of the first responders, the, the firefighters, the police officers, and everybody who came on the scene. There was not a thought in their heads about themselves at that moment. It was all about uh, taking care of the issue and the problem and, um, and making sure that, uh, that, that things got done. So I want to talk about how we can live into that kind of spirit of extravagant generosity on a regular basis. But before I get into the defining these terms, I want, to, uh, I want to talk for a second about a fictional organization. It's a fictional organization for two reasons. One, I made it up. And uh, two, I don't think they would ever work if it actually was an organization. The organization that I made up is called the SCPA. The SCPA. It stands for Self-Centered Persons Anonymous. 
Um, it's an organization that I would go to if there was one because I recognize the fact that I'm deeply self-centered and I know uh, that all of us, if we're honest, can, um, you know, can, can identify with this compulsion that we have uh, for our own self-preservation and, and selfishness. The SCPA, though, would not work because, for example, let's assume that we are the uh, inaugural meeting of the SCPA, and I get up and I say to you, hi, my name is Sean, and I'm a self-centered person. If you're familiar with the recovery uh, ministry or recovery uh, movement, uh, AA or NA or anything like that, there's a typically a response to that person when they say that. So if you know what the response is, please respond accordingly. Hi, my name is Sean, and I'm a self-centered person. Hi, thank you. Right, that's right. We would, we would, uh, we would respond that way. See, the, in, in the SCPA, however, I'm afraid that would never happen because I think what would happen is everybody would immediately start going, oh, you think you're self-centered? Let me tell you how self-centered I am. <laughs> you don't have any idea how self-centered I am. And, there, you know, this would begin a, a process of, 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 of mass hysteria, so it wouldn't work. And then I thought, you know, when you get to chip night, uh, chip night in the uh, in, in recovery ministry is 30, 60, 90 days sober, um, and you get chips for that, and there's a celebration. I thought with the SCPA, we probably would have to give out 30, 60, 90 minute chips for people who learned how to be selfless for a very short amount of time. Probably we would never get past the 30 minute chip. Because once a person actually got a 30-minute chip for being selfless, they would begin to brag about how selfless that they'd been for the last 30 minutes, and then they'd have to start all over again. Now, I make fun of that in order to, to come to the seriousness of the situation, which is our, our deep problem of self-centeredness. I believe that self-centeredness and selfish behavior is um, initially the, the, uh, the original sin. It was, it was what Satan tempted Eve with in the garden. When he said to her, you, you, you don't think that you'll die, do you? If you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge, you won't die. You will be like God. And something in Eve's little brain said, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe there is more. More than this perfect relationship that I have with my Heavenly Father right now. More than this perfect relationship that I have with Adam. More than this perfect relationship that I have with all of creation. Maybe there actually is more. And that's the, t the temptation on all of our parts is that we're continually tempted to more. To say, you know, this, uh, this amount of money in my bank account is not enough. This house is not big enough. This car is not fast enough, etc. And we're tempted in that way. And what we know intuitively is that living that way leads to death in our lives. We know that. We feel like or we're tempted by advertisements or the world or even Satan to say that more means I'm going to be happier, but we know that it, it, it doesn't lead to happiness, does it? Or that somehow more will lead to a fuller life, but it doesn't. It, it always leads to death. It leads to death financially. It leads to death spiritually. It leads to death relationally and, and so forth. There's a sea in Israel called the Dead Sea. Have you heard about this? It's a huge sea. The Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea, but it's called the Dead Sea for a reason, because nothing can survive in the Dead Sea. And the reason that nothing can survive in the Dead Sea is because the Dead Sea has no outlet. It, can't, it has no way of giving out. It only takes and takes and takes, and, and that leads to death. And that's what happens in our lives as well. We think that somehow... If we just keep on taking, that we're going to live, but it begins to kill us and eat away at us. So the Bible gives us some very uh, clear directives on how to flip that around and begin living a different way. And what the Bible teaches is not self-centeredness, but generosity. And here's a definition of generosity that I want to work with. It's a willingness to give one's time, talent, wisdom, and resources to bless or help another. Notice a couple words in here that are important. Willingness. We've got to be willing to do this. It's got to be something that we actually take the time to say, I will choose to live this way. Because otherwise, our natural conditioning will always lead us to take care of number one. It'll always lead us to look out for ourselves and to try to get what we feel like we need. Generosity is a willingness. And it's a willingness to give. It's a willingness to just to pour in our time, our talent, our wisdom, our resources. The United Methodist Church says our time, our talents, our gifts, our service, and our witness. When we join a church, we say this is what we're going to give to this church. 
Now, a few years ago, a bishop by the name of Robert Schnazy wrote a book called The Five Practices of a Fruitful Congregation, and he did an exploration of, you know, vibrant, fruitful, uh, thriving churches, and he said they all had five common characteristics, and one of them is what he called extravagant generosity. And here's extravagant. Extravagant is the adjective that we tack on to generosity, and extravagant means exceeding what is reasonable or appropriate. Absurd. <laughs> I like that. That generosity is not just simply giving, but it's absurdly giving. It's doing what seems ridiculous to the rest of the world. It's not, it's unreasonable. It's, it's not appropriate. It, it's outside the bounds of what's normal. And here's why Christians are extravagantly generous. Because the God that we serve is extravagantly generous. The God that we serve is is absurdly generous. Think about God for a moment, won't you? He looks down upon a bunch of selfish people who continually turn their backs on him, who continually wander away, who continually serve other idols, and yet he continues to say, here is my offering to you. I've given to you the, 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 most, uh, the, the closest thing to my heart. I've given you my most prized possession, my one and only son. I've offered him to you, to give his life to you, to, to die a horrific death for you, so that you might have life and have it abundantly. And I continue to offer that grace to you every time you turn back to me. That's absurd, y'all. And yet that's the kind of extravagant generosity that God offers to us. And in turn, when we begin to think about that, it tends to w want to motivate us to give that way as well, to be extravagantly generous in our lives. So I want to talk about generosity in, 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 in terms of this for just a moment or, or two. Three aspects of generosity that I think are important for us to think through. The first is this, that this kind of generosity that I'm talking about is spiritual. It's spiritual. You can't just be a regular person and be extravagantly generous. Now we could have all sorts of philosophical conversations about this and argue about this, and I've heard people tell me, hey, I can be good without God. I don't need God in my life in order to be good. I'm an atheist. I don't believe anything, and I'm a good person. And I, and I won't argue necessarily with that. I think you can be good. You can probably do some good things, but I don't really think you can be generous because generosity is a fruit of the Spirit. Generosity, we say the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and then we normally say goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That Greek word that's translated goodness can also be translated generosity. It's translated that way in one English translation that I know of. The New Revised Standard Version translates it as generosity. But that's the word. It's generosity. It's God's kind of giving. It's the kind of giving that we get when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We, there's something about the Spirit within us that wants to be generous. Generosity is an action attached to a spirit. It's not just giving. There's a, di there's a difference between giving and generosity. They're different things. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. He said, if I give all I possess but do not have love, I gain nothing. It's worthless. It's pointless. Now, in 1 John 4, verse 8, we get a definition of God. Do you remember what it says? God is what? Love. God is love. So you could say, if I give all I possess but do not have God, I gain nothing. See, generosity is spiritual. There's two impulses within each one of us. There's the fleshly, natural impulse to acquire, to hoard, and to keep. And then there is that spiritual impulse to share, to help, and to give. And we have the responsibility every day to make a willing decision about which impulse we will give into. Let me give you sort of a, um, an illustration. Some of you have been wondering why this rake is up here. I will now show you why this rake is up here. Some of you thought somebody just left it here on accident. Garrett, would you mind coming up and joining me for a second? I'm, um, Garrett and I are neighbors, okay, just in this, this fictional account here. He's my next door neighbor. And it's a Saturday, and so I'm busy watching football like I should on Saturday, right, which is the thing you do on Saturdays. And, uh, and Garrett has been watching some football, too. He's been watching uh, 
the, the Georgia Bulldogs play, and he's decided it's time to go do some yard work. So um, he, sees, he sees my rake, which looks a little bit like a Georgia Bulldog rake, and uh, he says, you know, I need to rake my yard. I'm going to go ask Sean if I can borrow his rake. So um, Garrett shows up at my house, and um, he asks me if I can borrow the rake. Pastor, may I borrow your rake? And now, as a self-centered person, here's how I respond. You know, Garrett, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm using my rake right now. I know it looks like I'm watching TV, but I'm actually, as soon as there's a break, I'm going to go out and rake my yard. So um, I'm sorry I can't really let you borrow my rake right now. I, uh, I'm going to be, I'm definitely using it right now. Uh, I, I know Tony has a rake, so why don't you run on by Tony's house and ask him, and I'm sure he'd be happy to give you his rake, okay? So m maybe we would re respond that way, maybe not quite like that, but for the most part, our self-centered nature sort of rises up. I mean, I, I don't know what Garrett's going to do with my rake. He might sell my rake. He might break my rake, right? He, something could happen with this rake. Now, there's another way that I could do this. I could be a little bit, a little bit nicer about this. Uh, let's try it again. Pastor, may I borrow your rake? Oh, gee, Garrett, um... All right, all right, all right. You can. I, uh, I'm probably not going to use it for a little while. I'm trying to watch this game, but I guess I'll let you take... Nah, um, Garrett, listen, here's what I need. I'm going to need something in writing that says that I'm going to get this rake back from you, okay, in an hour or so, so I'll, I'll let you borrow it. Now, you see, I'm, I'm going to give him my rake, but I'm going to do it begrudgingly, right? I'm not going to have a whole lot of enthusiasm or excitement about it. Now, you can go on back to your house. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, now, the spirit of generosity rises up within me, though, and I'm sitting here watching TV, watching the football game, and I hear Garrett out in his yard. I can hear, you know, some fussing going on out there and some leaves and things happening. So I, I take a look out my window, and I notice he's over there with a whole bunch of leaves and no rake. He's... Uh, He's trying to scoop all the leaves up by himself. He's got Casey out there and the kids, and they're all scooping leaves, and I can tell they're frustrated. So I take my rake, and I go to Garrett's house, and I say, hey, Garrett, I just noticed you guys were raking some leaves, and you might be in some need. Would you like to borrow my rake? In fact, I've, I've got a second rake. I'm going to go over and get my other rake, and if it's all right with you, I'm going to come over and help you rake. How's that sound? You see the difference in that? There's a, that's a spirit of generosity, and, and most, of us, most of us struggle with that, but that's what's available to us. God gives us the ability to be that way and to act that way, and I know people who act that way on a regular basis. Some, many of you in this congregation are that way. And I want to be like that. I want all of us to aspire to be like that, because here's what I know. When we act that way, we actually are happier and healthier people. That's point number two. Generosity breeds happiness. If you're looking to be happy in your life, and again, like I said last week, I don't know anybody who wakes up in the morning and goes, dear God, please let me be miserable and anxious all day today. Nobody does that. Everybody wants to be happy. And yet, so here we have right here in the scripture a, 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 a recipe for happiness. Remember last week I shared with you out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul said, if you're good and you're generous, you're actually going to experience the life that is truly life. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19. That's the remedy for it. That's the recipe for it, being generous. Generosity breeds happiness. Listen to this report. This was a report that was done uh, by Notre Dame University. Those are some good people over there, and uh, they're smart people. And they did a study on generosity, and here was their results. They said generosity is in its mature form a basic personal moral orientation to life. Furthermore, in a world of moral contrasts, generosity entails not only the moral good expressed, but also many vices rejected, like selfishness and greed and fear and meanness. And then, then, then they said this, If Americans want to be happier, healthier people who live with greater purpose, suffer less depression, and suffer less, less depression, and enjoy more personal growth, then they should learn to be more generous. That was their results. Generous people are ha happier, healthier, less depressed, and they grow, in per they grow personally. 
It just takes being generous. A guy wrote a book not too long ago, David Brooks, called The Road to Character. David Brooks is a journalist for the New York Times, and he was one of these guys who was kind of living for himself and living his life and trying to accumulate and gain stuff, and he said, I kept running into people who seemed happy, people who seemed like their, their life really mattered and that they were experiencing the fullness of life, and he said, I decided I was going to study those people and find out what it was that made them tick. And he said, what I discovered is that there are two types of virtues that most of us live by. He called them resume virtues or eulogy virtues. He said, resume virtues are those virtues that you put down on, on a resume that says, you know, I have this much experience. I've had this much education. It's the things that we do to sort of make ourselves look good in the world's, world's eyes. If your resume is really good, then you're, you get more money. You're more popular. You get better jobs. He said, what I discovered is that many people live out of those resume virtues, but ultimately what matters in the end is eulogy virtues, those things that people say about us at our funeral. He said this in the book, he said, don't, what I learned is don't ask what I'd want from life. Ask what does life want from me? And I think you can change that word life out to God again and say, don't ask what I want from God. Ask what does God want from me? We begin to ask that question and turn it around and say, you know, it's not about me. It's about what God desires for me. We can begin to live more into those eulogy virtues. What do people, what is, what do, what do people say at funerals about people? They say, man, I, I remember how, how decent and kind and good and loving they were, compassionate. Those are the kind of words that come up. Here's things you never hear at a funeral. Of course, his crowning achievement was when he made senior vice president. What everybody loved most about her was how she ate lunch at her desk every day. He was proud that he never made it to one of his kids' little league games because he was always going over those figures one more time. She didn't have any real friends, but she had 600 Facebook friends, and she dealt with every email in her inbox every night. You don't ever hear those kind of things at funerals. So why do we want to live that way? Here's what John Wesley said, and we believe John Wesley said it. I don't know for certain. Quotes are difficult. You never really know if people said them or not. They're sort of like statistics. 67% of all statistics are made up on the spot, you know, so. But we believe John Wesley said this. Whoever said it, uh, said it good and said it perfectly. This is what it says. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can. In all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. That's a good mantra to live life by. The last thing I'd like to say about generosity is it's worship. Generosity is worship. Everything that we have is God's. You all know this, right? We don't own anything. God owns everything. The psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world, and all who lives in it. When we begin to shift our thinking to remind ourselves that everything we have is a gift from God, it turns out that when we give back a portion of that, it's worship. When we give on Sunday mornings, when those plates come pass around, that's not an obligation or responsibility. It's not you paying your dues, you know, to be part of the church. It's, a wor it's an act of worship. God, I'm going to give. It's just like what Miss June did down here with the children. God just asks us for a portion of what we've been given to give back to him as an act of worship. God, I am so grateful and thankful for your willingness to give to me, absurdly give to me what I have. And, and you only ask for a small portion of that back. So generosity becomes worship. This is the way Paul put it. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your hearts to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I love that promise. In just a minute here, we're going to sing the song, Standing on the Promises. And this is a promise from God. If you give cheerfully, if you give proportionately, if you choose whatever you choose to give, and listen, if 10% works for you, then give 10%.
I think the tithe is a good standard. It works for Sandra and I. It's what we've chosen to do. We've not always tithed. We've had to find other smaller percentages at certain times in our lives. But now we, we tithe. We give 10% of our income. And sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it hurts. You know, somebody said uh, when it comes to giving until it hurts, most people have a very uh, small threshold of pain, right? So um, it's, sometimes it's difficult, and we understand that. But Paul says right here, choose what it is that you feel like you should give. But give something. Make some choice of how you're going to give your time, how you're going to give your talent, how you're going to give your resources to help the church to be all that the church can be. And when we do that, the promise is that you will be blessed abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God promises that he'll never let us go without. As long as we're willing to give, he'll give back to us. So I want to close with the contentment prayer this morning. I've asked, I shared this with you last week. And it's a prayer that I, I pray every day, and it's a prayer that I hope that you'll begin to pray every day as well. It's just a simple little prayer, but it's one that I think really can make a difference as we, as we think about what it means. So let's pray this together. Lord, help me to be grateful for what I have to remember that I don't need most of what I want and that joy is found in simplicity and generosity. Heavenly Father, I do thank you and praise you for your word to us this morning. I know it's a difficult word, a challenging word for many of us, but God, it, it is a way of life that you desire for us to live. This is not ultimately about giving money or carving out time to do something that we don't enjoy doing. This is about a spirit of generosity, a spirit that you desire for us to live out of, a willingness to just be people who give. And help us to remember and to know that doing that actually provides for us the happiness, the peace, um, the health that we so long for uh, in trying to find it in so many other ways. So help this word sink deep into our souls today, Lord, and help us to be faithful to do what it is that you've called us to do. As we prepare to give our pledges to this church for the next year, I pray that you will guide and lead each individual and each family um, to be generous and to give over and above what they think they can give, extravagantly generous, so that this church can do the kinds of things that we desire to do, to reach people who are far from you to reach people who are hurting and need in this community, to reach young people, um, to do what we can to be the kind of church that you desire for us to be. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for your goodness, for your extravagant generosity in our lives. Help us never take that for granted and to respond to that with great generosity on our part and great love. Amen. Amen.